Sarawak, <laughs> from the villages of Nufuolele, Lili, and Vialele. He's in his fourth year of teaching at Southern Cross Campus, and he's had a variety of roles within PPTA. He's a member of Ray Pacifica, and I know that um, we've got other members here. And that's a community entity which is exploring and questioning issues around um, the educational issues for Pacifica communities, and I think that's uh, really important. He's also a member of the Pacifica Excellence Group, and he is going to start our discussion today, and he has said that he could even dance if we wanted, so that's wonderful. <laughs> Um, and Backhouse, who is the facilitator of I Have a Dream. And this is a program that motivates, empowers children from low income communities to reach their education and career goals. Um, with a long term program of mentoring and tutoring and enrichment. And I know that um, from my knowledge of the program, it had its initiation or uh, at Wesley Primary School and um, Wesley Primary School is very close to the school that I'm principal of and and also the, the, the school that I was deputy principal of beforehand and so there's some knowledge around the effects of the program and how powerful that has been. Um, next to and we have Debbie Waikato and <laughs> And um, on the program we had Shirley Maihe and, and Shirley can't be here because of a bereavement but Debbie has ably stood in, in her place. Debbie is the principal of Lincoln Heights School and works with nine other schools including Finlayson Park School where Shirley is the principal in a bilingual education cluster and she's got a depth of knowledge around Pacifica achievement and I'm particularly looking forward to hearing you Debbie because our school we have a very strong Samoan and Tongan community we're 70% Pacifica and our Samoan community and I'm really pleased about this have come to me and said we want to start a bilingual Samoan in the school so I'm looking to you and Shirley to help me with making that happen. Um, over here we've got Jackie Hussey, who is a teacher from Waitaki College. And Jackie, I know that Waitaki are really proud of you because I looked up the site the other day and there you were after gaining your Master of Professional Studies in Education with First Class Honours, which is absolutely wonderful. And Chris has been on the fact that influence the success of Pacifica students, so we're really looking forward to hearing you. Damon, lovely to meet you too today. Head Professor of Auckland University Centre of Pacific Studies. He's the author of a number of books on the history of the Pacific and previously worked as an Associate Professor at the University of Michigan. And he also is the first Rhodes Scholar of Samoan and Pacific Island descent. We've got a wonderful line up here and I'm going to pass it first to Clint and then I think we'll just go along this way. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank God above and the many blessings he's given me for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the children we all care about. Um, my name is Clint Simsayer. Uh, for those who do need to know, because a lot of times some people come up to me afterwards and go, so what village are you from? <laughs> um, villages I come from, I hail proudly from Mofwali on my mother's side and from Vailili. Um, the Vailili side is only because I'm Mormons. I'm Mormon, so they, they hassle me. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but on my um, Mofwali side, my mother is from. Um, I'm very proud of New Zealand born Samoan. And sometimes the issue that I have, which perplexes me as a member of Race Pacifica, is some of the key factors around 
who's questioning who. A lot of times, um, people go forward and ask the questions to us as teachers, well, what are you doing? So, and a lot of times, we have ministry saying to them, oh, it's teacher's fault. And then we're saying, oh, it's the ministry's fault. And then we've got other entities like into QA's fault, you know, sort of thing. Um, for us, as Race Pacifica, we, we're tired of the finger pointing. We're tired of the finger pointing. And I guess the reason why um, it becomes crucial for me is my seven-year-old son is in the system. And sometimes I wonder whether the value of finger pointing is actually helping what my seven-year-old son needs to achieve to be successful in a country so diverse, yet bound by a bicultural system. It is um, systemically, majorly, and, and, and you know, anyone can have the issue with me later on about this, but it is the constant failure of us not just dropping the finger and putting out our hands. We say that we're a village trying to raise the child, Yet I feel sometimes that we're the ones pushing the child out. We are actually putting them in that box. I'll give you a prime example. Um, as my child was growing up, he went to EC, you know, they said they encouraged parents, oh, you know, you've got to make sure they get the best learning at preschool and things. So thanks, girl, for mentioning that girl, maybe. Um, but when I took him to preschool, they go, oh, okay, so as a parent, this is your responsibility. I said, okay. So I help him in his ABCs, help him count, help him do this, understand that, learn shapes and everything like that. But they said, no, he's still failing. You need to help him this way. So we took on the program, we applied him to happy program, learning, reading program, literacy program, whatever. We got him involved with community activities, learning how to swim, getting involved with you know, social skills and everything. And they still said, no, he's still failing. Try this. You know, that's good. Okay, cool. Annoying, but good. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's true, you know, because I'm not the professional, you know. I'm just a parent who's trying to get the best out of the individual who stands in front of my child. Okay, started primary school at five. Straight away, oh, he's actually failing already. And this is four weeks into the school system. Okay, now, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, I'm, I'm a young son man, I, I've been educated, I've got my degree from the University of Auckland. You know, I'm pretty good at reading information and understanding and researching and stuff like that, but I'm starting to get perturbed. The teacher goes, no, I'm sorry, he's Māori Samoan, so he's going to have issues. <laughs> and that's why I started looking around. Who can I go to to solve this problem? Where do I stand as a parent? I'm not standing here as a member of PPTA. I'm not standing here as a member of Grace Pacifica. I'm standing here as a father who has a seven-year-old son who's been told that he will always fail. My question then to everyone in the system is what are you going to do to change the failure? Because I am tired of hearing that. My wife is a general manager for the Ministry of Social Development. She works hard. She makes sure that our son does his homework at night. In the mornings, I get him ready, we get him planned, we teach him about planning. He knows literacy because he's reading his books, learning his alphabet, doing all his homework. I even ask the teacher to give him extra homework so that we can work with him at home so I need to know what they do. No, we, we as parents are ticking all the boxes and we're still being told, no, that's still not good enough. When is it good enough? When is it that we as teachers can finally say, your son has achieved this, your son has achieved that. My son can't speak up for himself because he's only seven. All he thinks is, oh, well, if I'm not going to do real well, I'll just go home and eat my lunch, I'll go to school, eat my lunch with my mates, get to play some rugby. And the thing that really, excuse my name, pissed me off, <laughs> was that the report that I got back from them, they put a comment in the bottom, we've noticed he's really good at playing league. <laughs> I don't want my son playing league. I want him to become the first son in swimming for New Zealand. And that's why I put him into swimming lessons. But you know, those factors become a crucial argument for me. And that's the reason why I stand here now in this, in this capacity as a member of Race Pacifica. This community group is here to try and develop 
ways where we can say to you as the professionals, as the individuals who stand before our children to find out really where, where are we failing or how can we help. It takes a village, I've heard this line, it takes a village to raise a child. Cool. I don't feel like I come from a village though. Because every time I go to those meetings with the teachers and everything like that, and this is a primary school that I, you know, I've had relatives go to the school and everything. They've lived, in, they've lived a good life. They've been in the public system. You know, he's at this public school system because I, you know, I was raised in the public school system. I went to Mountain Central, I went to Beta Intermediate, I went to Otahu College, you know, enjoyed my lunches all there as well. It's so, okay, you know, very good. But the key question is that I'm tired of going to these meetings, these parents' meetings, and they still say, no, he's just under the standard. No, he's not getting his influence. If he's reading Harry Potter at seven and can tell me why these children are running around trying to kill these naughty people, I think he's got influence. You know? So for me, it's trying to not, um, you know, take the assumptions of the child the minute you meet them, it's more of the finding their successes and reporting it back to me as a parent. That's why I got involved with Race Pass Speaker. That's why I want to make sure that when I come to meetings, that should the system change, that there is someone speaking on behalf of me. Okay? Fundamentally, there's still nobody there. Fundamentally, there are probably hundreds of other parents around here. And granted, you as parents, grandparents, uncles and aunties, you know, you're doing your thing as well to try and make sure that your children are successful. I want my child to be successful in the public system that my mother raised me in. Because she couldn't afford me to go to King's or to De La Salle at the time. She said, no, you're gonna be you're gonna be the best kid in this in that school, and I'll make sure you do that. You know, many riches man can never receive than the richness of a mother who read to me. That was the one thing my mother made sure was that I knew how to read and understand what was happening around my life. So, as a voice at this time, you're probably wondering, where do I stand? As an apolitical group, we are only here to ensure that someone speaks for those who don't. We are here to ensure that as professionals that we can find solutions, which we all have found solutions, but to ensure that we can push those solutions onto the people who actually make decisions on our behalf. As to why they make those decisions, I do not know. But we cannot just say, yeah, 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 stop, stop, stop. And then they say, nah, we're gonna do it anyway. And then we walk away from the argument. Because too many times we walk away. Don't walk away from the argument. I beg you, don't walk away. You know, I'm still arguing that national standards is dirt crap. We need to sort this out. Even though it's been thrust down your throats as NCDI members and local you know, primary teachers, I stand by you and argue the issue. I still go to my the principal of my son and say to him, you better have an excuse as to why this national standard is not understood by us as parents. I push the issue on her because she's the one responsible for it, to explain it, to make sure it's clear. So for me, I'm putting these questions out there to remember there is a community of people who will not come to community meetings. There is a community of people who cannot make it. Why? Because both of them are still going to work on a Saturday to make sure they can get to the table, pay for that power bill that's going to get cut off so they can get the meter running again. Okay? They're the parents who actually still have seven other children to worry about, but they can only leave their 15 year old son to take care of them. You know, they're the parents who are unable to find a job because they're low in their literacy and numeracy, and they don't know where to go to find a solution. So functionally, that's why I am on this um, panel. I'm just putting the questions up there for this course. You know, as a diaspora group, I know the issues. I've seen it through my parents' eyes. I've seen what the problems were with my dad when he had to go job after job after job after job and never went beyond the factory hand. You know, he's been a factory hand all his life. Bless him. He made sacrifices to make sure I got to eat as he came empty. <laughs> so in closing, I, I, I put this question to you as, as professionals. When are we going to put the finger of blame down and when are we going to put out the hands of success? Thank you.
Well, kia ora, kia rana, malo lale, tolo falawa, whakalopala miatu, greetings to you all from the many nations that are represented in my shirt, which I call my dream of whanau. And uh, my name's Ann Backhouse from the I Have a Dream program. We've been working with a group of Pacifica students since they were eight years old at Wesley Primary at SL 1A school. They are now all 18 years old in their last year of high school. <coughs> Basically what I want to suggest to you is that we are all in this country, no matter what our ethnicity, for one thing, opportunity. Whether we came here on our walkers from the shores of Hawaii to, to this country, whether we came here on our ships from England, whether we came here on our silver birds from the islands, we still came here for opportunity. That was what drove us to come here. And if I could be a little bit cheeky, maybe we came here on an ideolo ideology. That, that opportunity did exist. And, and therefore we shouldn't be scared sometimes of ideology because, because m many of the change makers in the world made, made change and, and got to succeed to where they are on some ideals that they believed were out there. And so, so, so we're all here for an opportunity, but the thing is, that opportunity, it comes through two goals, through education and employment. You need to pass through those goals to, to meet many of those opportunities that exist. And many of these symptoms that we've been talking about in society that, that Gil and the others have talked about in their schools are a result of people who haven't been able to get through into the land of opportunity because they haven't been able to have equality passing through those goals of education and employment. Currently, in New Zealand, we have a skills shortage. When we look at where those skills shortages are, they are in higher levels of learning jobs. We import people from overseas to take those jobs. They are taking, you know, jobs that are out there. Those higher levels of learning are where we need to be able to get our country and our young people into to make sure that they can have those jobs. The skills shortage, things like engineering, technology, food science, they're not things that just require low levels of learning, they require a higher level of learning. With our rising Pacifica and Māori numbers, some forecast it to be as high as perhaps 50% of Auckland by 2050, and with current Pacifica Māori education and achievement where it is, then in, by, that, by that time, 2050, Houston, we have a problem. So it's up to us as a country to think, well, how do we get, how do we get kids achieving better? Our statistics for our program, we've taken, we've, like I say, we started with them when they were eight years old. Of the, of the 38 that still currently remain in New Zealand, SL1A kids, you know, 30, 34 of them are still in education, of which 32 are in formal high school in their, in their year 13 year. Another one is employed, and one of the others intends to return to study next year. I know, and I, I know that that what we have done <coughs> works. Why does it work? Because it's really simple. Okay, it's a wraparound approach, and you and you, you talk, heard about Gil talking about that. How, one of the things that we've got to think about is like, where is the money going? You know. Now, the government encouraged, they, they, they say to high schools, they say to high schools, they say, you've got the money, we give you the money, it's about how you use it. I'm saying back to the government, you have the money, it's about how you use it. Because the government just released a report that they spent 78 million dollars on welfare, sorry, 78 billion on welfare over a lifetime. Okay? The 4,000 young people that enter, the, enter welfare by the age of 18 make up $1 billion over a lifetime of money that we pay for. Now, if you were to, if you were to, if you were to give me that $1 billion, I could put 36,000 kids through this program. 36,000 kids through this program, and if each one of them went into, not onto welfare, but then into employment and education, they would return the equivalent of $10 billion over their lifetime of working and earning to this country. $10 billion. Now if you took 10% of that tax, the 10% of that $10 billion, and reinvested it back in, you would have a self-sufficient, 
program that is investing in our young people and, and sustainable instead of just pouring tons and tons of money into welfare at the other end. Our country needs to invest early into early interventions, into early pathways. So what do we do? Yeah, I'm going to race through it. Five things that our program does. One, we create a plan and a purpose for the kid. Who are you? Where are you going? How are you going to get there? We have long-term, consistent quality relationships. I've been working with those kids for 10 years. And there's plenty of other people out here in society within our Pacific our Māori communities who would do exactly the same as I would with their kids and their whānau to make sure that they achieve. I'm an advocate in the school. I'm bringing an academic mentoring around them. The second thing, though, is that we make sure that the young person is connected. It's not just about me. It's about making sure that they're connected, one, to their history, to their family, to their culture, the, the, the place that they came from, and all our families are on, come on, on this journey with us. And we started from that point. Will you come on this journey with us as a family? Secondly, we said, we, we want to bring them into connection in the now. Tutors, mentors, people that are helping them out, that can actually build their capability, connecting them to their communities, connecting them to their schools. And thirdly, connecting them to their future, transitions into employment, into meaningful jobs, into higher levels of learning, and to business. We're bringing an access of resources around them. We have a building where they can come to to study every day after school, access computers and internet, many of the things that the kids simply can't afford at home or where the house is so busy they just can't concentrate on their homework. But the greatest thing that we've been able to achieve over 10 years is we've built an extended dream as far now. This, this, this concept that it takes a village to raise a child. We've got mentors, tutors, families, all, lots of people involved around these kids that are making sure that they transition. Now, those are the top five things about our program that create a wraparound support, where we're working within the schools and, and within our communities. But what are the top three things that the students say will make a difference for their achievement and their achievement in the classroom? Because it seems like, for a lot of us, with grey hair, who sit around in buildings and ivory towers and in parliament, we, and, and, and in finals like this today, we discuss all these we discuss all these issues of class sizes, charter schools, quality teaching, the use of data and information. But sometimes I think we've forgotten to ask the students themselves what will make a difference for you. And and I spend a lot of time talking with Māori and Pacifica students, Pacifica students especially. And these are the top three things that come up for them. See if it has anything to do with m many of those things. One, first of all, they want to be fe feel like they're treated fairly and evenly in the classroom. Everyone wants to feel like they belong. Second, they don't want the teacher to shout at them. But they want to. They want to. Um, they want to the, the teacher to talk to them more like students, more freely, talking in ways that they can have a say, letting students have input and contributing to discussion in class. They want to feel like they belong. Teachers. Thirdly, teachers getting to know the students more, coming alongside them rather than judging them based on what they see in front of them or what they've heard about them. They want to feel like they belong. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that there's a two-stage manual gearbox of learning. One, it has to start out of quality relationships. We spend a lot of time talking about quality information, but it has to start out of quality relationships. The, the point is, belonging, that feeling of belonging in the classroom is the, is the first part of the circle of courage. It's the, it's the most important part of youth development. Feeling belonging and feeling connected are two important parts. You know, when, the kid, when my kid walks into the physics class, which Gil talked about, I know why not many kids take physics, because when she walked in there, in her first year of NCEA level one, and had made the criteria to get in there, first thing the teacher says, are you sure you've met the criteria? And she looked around at her mainly white class. You know, or conversations that maybe you should think about leaving school and taking a course. You know, my, my, my challenge to all of us as teachers is if you don't have hope for our students, you shouldn't be allowed to teach them. The second idea is obviously once you've got those quality relationships and your students do belong, is that engagement to make sure that you, you better have the goods to deliver. You know, and that's what, these are some of the conversations that we're talking about, the quality of teaching. But what I'm suggesting is that it starts from a place of belonging. May I suggest that our mainstream education is actually ranked high on PISA scores. We've got a good quality education si system. However, there are inequalities in it. Okay? 
Remember, many of our Pacifica communities migrated here for our education system and what they saw in our education system and in our employment here. But when we unpackage some of the arguments, some of the things that are going on around charter schools, around race Pacifica, around all these sorts of things, when you unpackage those, why do those things exist? May I suggest that they exist because our mainstream education system has failed to make people feel like they belong. And, and when, when, so, so for mainstream education, we need, to, we need to work on that. We need to think, how do we make our kids feel like they belong, that we actually want them to achieve? Because when, when, we, when we solve that problem, from there, we may see some change. Hello, Falaba, Kiorana, Fakalo Falagiatu, Namaste, Falavanaka, Kioran, Namahino Ike Koto. My name is Debbie Waikato, and I am absolutely privileged and honoured to speak to you all today. I live out west, I don't live out south, but I did used to teach at Papa Toy Toy Intermediate. I was there for seven years before I moved back out west, where I call home, where I grew up. I've lived all around Auckland, I've lived in Māngri, I've lived in Flatbush, Papatoi Toi, lived in Rimuera over on the shore, and I've also um, lived um, most of my life out in West Auckland. I come to you today representing um, the Auckland Samoan Bilingual Education Cluster. Shirley Maihi sends her apologies, um, as we've already heard, she couldn't be here this evening. And I was very, very nervous um, when she spoke to me two days ago and said, would you please speak instead of me? Because Shirley is so well known to many people in this room. And uh, I certainly would have um, valued coming along to hear her speak today. But what I did want to share with you was just a little bit about um, our journey as a school over the past few years. And we, as we've taken a journey um, particularly with our Samoan community, towards a bilingual unit. Before I go there though, four days ago I spent some time at the LMB Motor Lodge. Um, pop your hand up if you were there along with me. I know there were a few people in the room who were there. Yeah, so on Thursday at the LMB Motor Lodge, there was a hearing. Um, the Education Select Committee were there and they spent the entire day from about quarter past eight or so right the way through till um, four I believe in the afternoon or perhaps even later and they listened to over 20 submissions from people like yourselves and others in our community about early childhood education and the place that Pacifica language should have in early childhood education. It was an absolutely amazing event to be at I uh, was able to take Marcina Ngangamoy, who's here today, and she's been very much a huge part in making the uh, Samoan bilingual unit at our school happen. I really didn't know what to expect. I had not written a submission on behalf of our school, but as I sat there and listened to the passion from the people um, in the room, I really wished I had. And so um, after Saidi and Finlayson Park had um, made decisions to stand up and song throughout this very, very formal occasion and make people feel more welcome, I made a decision that I stand as well. But I spent a long time listening and a uh, couple of nights ago, after the conversation with Shirley, I really thought, what is it that I'd like to say to you? Because I can share the story about our bilingual unit and I will do that shortly, but there were some really key things that were spoken about on that day and I've just got a few notes for you because I really think that it does sum up what is needed for um, Pacifica students to succeed. And the messages that were shared, these were messages that were from um, doctors, there were doctors that spoke, these were messages from teachers, these were messages from parents from teachers, but also from children. So here we go, this is what they said. So I'm speaking on behalf of uh, our primary colleagues about what I heard. And I certainly, I, I don't have all the answers, but as been spoken, what's been spoken about a lot so far is that collectively we do. So this is what they said. We need policy which values Pacifica languages in our Pacific nation. We need 
the normalizing of Pacifica languages in education. We need the value of best practice bilingual education models to be acknowledged. We need research to be aligned and connected. And yes, there is, you know, there's lots of questions. Do we have enough research? There is a lot of research, particularly into um, bilingual education, which is what I'm mainly focused on. But what, what the comment was, was is that research aligned and have we actually connected those dots? We need the backing of the pioneers who are on the frontier. We need the valuing of our teaching profession and to provide us with the tools to get the job done. For example, the return of the Tupu series. We need school, strong school governance and strong school leadership. We need communities who have a collective, shared, strong vision for the children they serve. We need church, school, family and community all to be connected. We need tailored professional development that meets community need. And we need raised awareness within the community of what is working. I was just blown away. I uh, went back to school and we had a team leaders meeting the following morning. <coughs> And I sat there and I, I sort of emailed somebody and said, I really want to talk about this. And it was just so, so difficult. It's taken me, you know, a number of days to actually absorb everything that I heard and put that together. But there were a lot of people in that room who had some very, very important things to say. And I'm really uh, pleased that I had the opportunity to share them with you. So we all dream of a nation of confident, productive members of society who contribute to our community. And in my view, and it's also that of ASBEC, the Auckland Samoan Bilingual Education Cluster, this confidence and productivity can be gained through bilingual education. We know that bilingual education makes the difference to students' holistic well-being, and we also know, because we've researched it, and we continue to ensure that research and evidence you know, evidence informs our practice, we know that skills that are learnt in one language are readily transferable to the other. We've got evidence in our units that our children are achieving. But we're also aware that by strengthening the identity of one culture, and in um, Finlayson Parks and Richmond Roads, for example, it's not just one culture, there are other cultures as well, where we have those bilingual units, but we know that by strengthening the identity of a culture, that it highlights the needs of other Pacific groups and other cultures, and this leads to more pioneering. So our bilingual unit, it was opened in 2010, and we have, I think, I keep counting because they keep on coming in, but I think we are um, up around 32, 33 now. We have 33 children, two classrooms, Mata, one of the teachers in the unit, is here and she's been with us for the last couple of years. And we've really seen the effects, the fruits of many years of planning to make that happen. We didn't just decide overnight um, when our, you know, our parents said, let's have a unit and, and we you know, started the next year. And that could, be, could have been done. But we spent maybe two or three years doing research with our parents with all of our staff, not just the teachers and the leaders in our school, but with all of our staff, including our support staff, our caretaker, our librarian, everybody, we spent time researching to make sure that we all knew what we were all getting ourselves into. just want to share a little story with you. Uh, last week, if you're a teacher in the room, you'll know what I'm talking about. Last week, um, we had uh, a cluster speech competition. So. Um, we're part of the North West Cluster and our cluster is divided into, um, into two groups. And our school had done speeches. So the children had prepared speeches, we had syndicate speeches, a year five, six competition, a year seven, eight competition. And the winners of each of those went through to the cluster competition. I was delighted when the winner of the year five, six speech competition happened to be a Samoan student male Samoan student, and the winner of the Year 7 8 speech competition happened to be a Samoan male student. 
Now, neither of those students had been through our bilingual unit, because we believe in growing up from the bottom up. So as um, the children enter, we add another year on, so we're just year one to four. Neither of those children had been through our unit, but I don't think that it's a coincidence that these two students actually shone in front of their peers on that day. I don't, I, it could be, but I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. What I think happened, and we see this in our school, our children, our Pacifica children, our, um, our Samoan children, and other ethnicities, but particularly our Samoan children, are beginning to realise that their identity is valued in our school. And they are very, very confident to speak. They are very, very confident. They, they will not stand up in front of their peers anymore and cower or be shy because we have told them collectively that we value their identity. What was even more wonderful than that, they went to the speech competition and our Northwest cluster, as I said, was divided into two. Lincoln High School managed to get itself into the side of the cluster where um, the higher decile schools are. And our two student students went into that room, double, you know, probably bigger than this in terms of audience. They were the only Pacifica students in the room. Everybody else that spoke was um, Pākehā or Asian. And in year five, six, out of all of those schools, our student for year five, six came third, and our student for year seven, eight came second. So I know, I mean, I can talk to you about the results. We're forced to use national standards to test our um, students in the bilingual unit, and I am incredibly angry about that. Don't get started about that. But in terms of the fruits, we can talk about achievement. I can share achievement information about how we're seeing that it's succeeding already. But just that little story about um, you know our students and their success at the speech competition really highlights for me that I know that those in our school and those in that cluster that are putting in so much time and energy into making it happen for our children, I am very confident it works. So, finally, and in closing, on behalf of the primary sector, I'd like to say that when all of these areas are aligned, listen to the piece, policy, pioneering, people, passion, and pride, education will work for Pacifica. Thank you. Um, for love of my Lord is before, and my name is Jacqueline Pussy. I'm a teacher at a Waitaki College. I've been there for over 10 years. I'm a social studies girl of here <laughs> and a history teacher. Um, I was lucky enough to get a study award last year to do my master's, so I was very fortunate for that and um, because what it did, it allowed me to um, look into something that I was really, really passionate about. Mm -hmm. At my school, um, a good friend of mine, Marcy Lennon, and I run what we call the Tall Poppies Program. It's a mentoring program where we specifically focus on high achieving Māori and Pacifica students. And what it is, we mentor these students, academic mentoring, and we get these kids um, I'll refer to the students a lot as my kids. Um, well, we get them equipped, we teach them things like study skills, um, study skills, essay writing, what kind of student am I? You know, we do all these things. It's the whole idea of it is trying to equip these kids with the skills that's necessary for them to go to university, stay at university, and then go to wherever they need to go. Um, and these kids were high achieving PIs and Maori kids. And through the conversations with these kids, um, they often talk about their disappointment and how there's so much money, so many initiatives poured into, um, you know, to question what's going on with PI being low achievers and so on. And there's nothing that often looks at them about being successful Maori and PI students. Because even though in the media, um, wherever we look, there's always this, uh, you know, we've been bashed with, like it's been mentioned before, that Māori and PI kids are non-achievers. They live in low decile, um, low socioeconomic areas. 
um, all that money is important. There's nothing positive that comes out of these um, media reports. And these <coughs> just feel like they're left out. What about taking the time to look at them? They're successful kids. We are successful. PI kids and my kids are achieving out there, but there's not enough focus on this. And the whole idea of what I wanted to do in my study was look at these kids, what is working for them, and take that further to try and empower those that are just, you know, the at-risk kids, try and lift, the, you know, lift these achievements up. And that basically is a rundown of what I've done. Um, so, apart from the fact that I love the time off, you know, to rejuvenate and ignite the passion that I have for teaching, I, my research was about talking to um, Samoan students, year 13 Samoan students from a low decile school, and what they define or what elements of success is for them and what works for them, what making them become these successful um, achievers or high achievers that we don't hear of. And the whole idea about this too is about celebrating these successes because I don't think there's enough out there you know, that, um, about celebrating our kids. So what I came up with basically, so I'm just going to talk to you about what I've, what I've come across. And one of the biggest things that, um, that came to me was that the students um, said to me that self-belief was the biggest thing. Success is about believing. And a lot of them um, said that if you don't believe that you can do it, then there's no way that you will achieve. If people in the media, um, newspaper are always going to focus about their um, Pacifica students, Samoan students as being um, low achievers, they're not going to, you know, it's not going to motivate them, it's not going to make them want to get out there and achieve. And the thing with these kids that they believed in themselves, that they wanted to achieve, and that's what was the driving force, is that not only they believe in themselves, the parents believe in themselves, so there's a lot of talk about our parents, our Pacific Island parents are not very good at you know, praising and acknowledging our kids. We are. We're also very good at telling them what to do, you know, go for hours and things like that. But we've got to take some credit. Our parents actually are really good and are proactive. So the kids said that belief, self-belief was the main thing for them. Because if you can believe, then you can achieve. Um, the second thing that I found was that kids said was biggest part of their achievement was parental support. These parents were so proactive, um, like I mentioned before, uh, so pro uh, parents are proactive. Like, we don't just turn up for rugby games, we don't just turn up for parent interviews or the festival stuff. These parents got in there, challenged the system. There is a stigma about Pacific Island parents not wanting to challenge authority. Okay? These parents did exactly that. If there was something they didn't understand, if something they didn't feel was right with, you know, about their child's education, they were there. So, you know, we do have to take our hat off to the parents that are doing really well. And they are the key to these kids being successful. Okay, and in terms of schools and communities, we have to allow opportunities for our parents to feel confident to come in, you know, into our school and ask the hard questions and so on. Um, Teacher-student relationship, which we all know, how crucial and how important is that, you know, to the achievement of our kids. And building a rapport, the kids are saying, my teacher and I are so tight, you know, it's a mutual understanding, a mutual respect. And they both have that goal that, you know, they both have to achieve. The teacher has to be an effective teacher, the student has to be a you know, confident, effective learner. And if the two of them have that same mutual understanding and respect, and have this common goal, you know, success is, is right there, and so on. And the teach, you know, as a teacher, we often get bashed also about not being effective teachers. We are effective teachers. Okay, there's so many of us that work so hard, you know, that go out of our way. And I'm, you know, and I, and I'm speaking of the teachers that do exactly that. You know, I'm a teacher, and like I said, I'm a teacher, but I'm also a senior dean. I've become a translator, I've become a cleaner, I'm the auntie at school, you know, anything. That is just our role, and that comes natural to us. It's not about an MMA, or, you know, that comes with you. It's just what comes natural, it's just what we do. Because we are in the job for being a 
what we love to do, and that is why I get into teaching. Um, so, uh, student teacher, uh, we're quite nervous because I'm among some pretty eminent people, <laughs> and it's not every day you ask to um, speak. Um, so, student teacher relationship is really, really, really important. Um, the kids know that you care, and if they know that you actually believe in their own ability to achieve, then you know we know what will happen. Um, identity, we touched on. I did some of my lectures when I did the TESOL are here too. And um, I always went through school, people saying, um, you know, don't speak Samoan at school. You know, I am Samoan born. Don't speak because you're not going to get anywhere with your Samoan. It wasn't until I got to high school that I saw my first Samoan high school teacher. Okay, and we were allowed to speak Samoan at school. Okay. Um, parents have this idea that um, we struggle to get our parents at our school to allow their kids to take Samoan because they don't understand, you know, they think that it's not going to get them anywhere. Okay? Your kid can take Samoan, they can become lawyers, better lawyers probably if they speak Samoan or speak Tonga or whatsoever, but we need to tell parents these kind of things. Um, identity, like I'll go back to identity. Uh, the kids spoke about how important to, to know who you are, where you come from. Okay, you're too long a why why. You know you're some you know someone person by who they are and how they stand. And so on. this was really, really important. And also not just identity with their culture, but their belief in their um, spiritual affiliations with their church. And if schools and teachers and people of influence, you know, understand how important this is in students achieving these, I guarantee you, like um, Debbie touched on, our kids will thrive. Um, one of the things that was really interesting and the title of my work was to give back to the hand that fed me. And this is about one of the kids that I um, did a research on and he said that success is about being able to give back. It was about reciprocity. Um, them doing really well at school was giving back to their parents. Giving back to their parents who are working two to three jobs just to, you know, making me just to get them through, just to pay the, the $76 NCA fee, just to get the laptop because we're all telling them that kids should be e-learning and so on so they can do their work. Okay. You know, it's just something that resonated with me and, you know, to give back to them. And it's not just to give back to their parents, it's about giving back to the teachers and to the community. And these kids, I know, will grow up to be fantastic citizens, you know, of our country and will do so much more um, than what the money, you know, can um, provide us. And then, um, so what I really, really basically want to say is that um, we need, in terms of our students, Yes, we, we all, I'm always saying to kids, you need to get 80 credits to pass the SEA level one. But what we need to do first is ignite that passion, ignite, um, you know, self-belief. Get the kids to believe that they can do it. Support teachers. Um, teachers to get to know the kids, get to know who they are, where their culture, where their family comes from. Um, people to, so there needs to be some initiative put in place to support our parents. A lot of our parents want to help our kids but don't know how to go about it. Okay? Provide, you know, a home centre. <coughs> Tell parents this is what NCA and NCA I've seen a million NCA forms and it's not written in a language where our parents can understand. Even maybe if you think it's simple English, but it's not. Okay, we need to educate our parents to be able, you know, equip them with the skills to help them um, help their kids. In terms of literacy and numeracy, even let them tell them that even if reading the Bible, that's really that's literacy. That's really really important. Um, I could go on forever, but I think um, what I really really um, stress is that um, for me, oh one of the I did forget something really really important, and this is um, that we need to provide visions and models of success rather than stories of failure. And that was the biggest thing that I came up with um, that the students were telling me. Jill touched on it about um, also earlier was that 
kids are so aware of the perceptions that people have out there of them, being the Samoan, being Pacifica, um, coming from Ōtara, Ōtahuhu, wherever. They are sick and tired of that. So the reason, the other reason why they are succeeding is because they want to change this type of perception that people have of them. Okay, so they give back to the community and say, we are achieving, we are someone and we are doing hell of a lot better than some, you know, than some of you people think we are. And I think in everyday learning, you know, visions of success, stories of success needs to be put through, I don't know, TV, newspaper, wherever. But a lot of that needs to be, we need to see a lot more of that. Um, for our kids, something to motivate them, not something to that is to be detrimental to them. We need to provide these visions of success, and if it's the only thing I could, if you understand of what I'm trying to say, um, it's about making a difference and providing those stories of success for our kids. Thank you. A few mice to my I'm Damon Salisa, and I stand between you and lunch. So. <laughs> Yeah, when I was living in England, one of my favourite television advertisements was all these famous people from Tony Blair to Sean Connery uh, to sports stars and musicians. Um, nights of where I'm standing up and saying one name, each of them said one name. And then they'd go to the next person, they'd say one person's name. And at the end of the ad, they just had a slogan, which was, nobody forgets a good teacher. So the first thing is when we ask, what makes a difference? Teachers make a difference. So to the teachers here, thank you. Remember that on those bad days, you can still make a difference. I remember all my teachers, but mostly I remember the really bad ones. <laughs> but I remember the good ones much more fondly. So if nobody forgets a good teacher, teachers make a difference. And if nobody forgets a teacher, people sure as hell don't forget their parents. Right? Parents make a difference. And the challenge we have is how do we make a difference in the lives of parents and families. We're left in a situation where we have to improve families and children's lives with an instrument, schools and education, that's not designed to improve their lives. Poor families can't instantly be made rich by what you teach in your classroom, but that's what we're asking you to do. And that's the challenge I think that we face. And so uh, the problem for me is when I came back after living in the States for 10 years, my assumption was things would be better. That I'd, I'd see the statistics and Pacific statistics would be better. And they're not, they're worse. Right. And I think because my parents always assumed that we would have a better life than them, and they were right, I thought that was true for everyone. And this is, I think, the depth of the challenge we're facing. You know, we have to keep doing what we're doing here. We have to keep turning up. We have to keep owning our education. But we also have to realise that education can't be a magic bullet. We can't fix all the problems we need to in the classroom. Um, and that's why I think part of the, the power of teachers is not just as teachers, but as advocates for children and communities. And so this is why these kinds of occasions are so important. I know for myself, until I was 22, I didn't know my father hadn't graduated high school. <laughs> he neglected to tell me. But he did run, for instance, to be the chairman of the Glen Owens Primary Board of Trustees. So he did not by saying, not by telling me education was positive and that I should be participating in it, but just by doing. Right? And that is actually the role modeling that we are lacking. I think today we still say the same things to our kids. Education is important, but many of us don't act in that way. And that's the message that children receive. So this is a, is a big problem. And the problem with teachers too is that they get to take most of the blame and schools take blame, but they get very little credit. So for the difference schools make, which is not typically measurable to government, they get blame, but they don't get credit. And so part of what we need to do, and this is as a community and as educators, I'm a teacher too, is to sort of gird ourselves and be strong about this and actually make sure that the good work we're doing is being witnessed. And, and so I hope um, I hope that's something that comes out of all of this. I know there's some powerful eyes um, that are sitting in a, a certain house in, in Wellington in this room. Um, so it's an important thing that I think we share this commitment. 
For me, if I had to say one thing though about what can we do to make a difference, part of it, in fact I think a big part of our problem in thinking about this is that we're misdiagnosing the problem. I think that there are many ways this is true and most of you will know much more about this than I do. I teach at a, in a relatively privileged job at a relatively privileged university. But one of the things we're misdiagnosing is who these kids are. One of the questions was, why don't we ask the kids? Right, and I think that's an important part of the, the solution. But also to recognize the diversity in our kids. It isn't, it isn't saying that we measure, for instance, the life that my children have alongside the life of you know, unemployed children living in deprived areas. We have to actually recognize that within Pacific communities, there's a great spectrum of how people live and work. And we have to make sure that's in our mind when we claim to speak for everyone, because none of us can. And if we pay attention to the other divisions between, some, there's too many Samoans in this world, I know, straight away. I'm sure all the Tongans and the Kadaka are the too. That's but, but, you know, there are some differences that we must treasure and honor as we speak for Pacific people, right, between those different communities. And for me, the difference that I find most distressing is when I look around a, a university lecture theatre, the question I have is, where are the boys? Where are the boys? Yeah, I, in my, one of my classes, our big Pacific class, we're about 80% Pacific women. But that, to me, is like something is going massively wrong. You know, and, and unless we recognize these kinds of differences, that we're seeing, we can't actually produce the right kind of answer if we're not asking the right kinds of questions. I'm sure this is not used anymore. Um, so, I think part of the, the way of solving and asking what makes a difference and finding the right answer, I always find sustenance in one of my favorite books, which is written by a German economist, the sound bad. but it was called Small is Beautiful. And in that book he begins by talking about um, shoe manufacturing machines. How they make these great machines now that basically take in all the ingredients and they split out shoes at the end of it. And he, he loves the English. But the problem is, if you want to build good shoes, what you need to know is not shoes, it's feet. You have to build a shoe to fit a foot. And when we go forward, we've seen so many answers, and I think the principal of Otahu College had the right thing. Everyone's tried this before. Right. There's not one answer. We have to get the right answers in our bag of tricks and pull them out to answer the right problem. And I think we need to build the right shoe and put it on the right foot. And so if you were to ask me what would make a difference immediately, and it has to be immediate. You know, not prepared to wait for, for things to get worse. That is, that is essentially where we might begin. So thank you.